The Last Indian War by Michael Graff, based on a true story. Super, Buffalo Raceway, Hamburg, New York. Exterior, Hamburg Fairgrounds, Grandstand, same time. A huge bear of a man in his late 30s towers above the crowd. Glenn Pop Warner clutches a beer in one enormous hand and the butt of a soggy cigar and tobacco-stained race ticket in the other. Pratt and Sam cling to their racing forms, feeling very out of place. The crowd is on its feet. Grown men and women jump up and down, cheering as Dan Patch streaks past the finish line. Son of a bitch! He downs the beer in a hearty gulp and heaves the empty cup toward the track. Mr. Warner, as I was saying. You son of a bitch, not you, him, Dan Patch. I told you, call me Pop. He crumples his losing ticket and drops it in Pratt's cup. My friends all call me Pop. Sorry, Mr. Warner, uh, Pop, as I was saying, the boys have raw talent but need proper training. I've been on the biggest, strongest, best bred horse, and that son of a bitch beats me every time. <clears throat> I need another beer. Sam is frustrated and wants to leave. This is a waste of time. Pratt flags down a beer vendor for a pint. Pop motions for two pints instead. Who beats you? That flea bag of a horse, Dan Patch. He should have been hauling milk cans across town. He's got a shit pedigree and is the smallest damn horse on the track, and the son of a bitch wins every time. Pop downs the beer in two enormous gulps and grabs the second out of Pratt's hands. This guy led Cornell to an undefeated season? With all due respect, we travel a long distance to come to talk to you about football, not horse racing. We've made a terrible mistake. Good day, Mr. Warner. Pratt tips his hat and he and Sam make for the exit. I'm talking about football. Pratt and Sam stop and turn back. We lost one game to Michigan. Those sons of bitches. I went undefeated coaching Georgia. I'm the highest paid coach in college football and every school in the country has offered me a job. And you write to me begging for this meeting and now you give me the high hat? That takes brass. Pratt bows his head slightly. My apologies. As I said, we came to talk football. Our players aren't taken seriously, so we're in need of a coach, someone that can build a respectful program. We're sorry to waste your time. What are you offering? Pratt is surprised by the question. Freedom. Pop laughs. Freedom? Yes, freedom. We can't match George's generous $40 a week, but we can offer you a freedom to, to build a sports program from the ground up with no outside interference. May I ask you a question? Pop grunts as he pulls out a new cigar. Why do they call you Pop? I took time before school to work out west, driving cattle and living under the stars. When I finally went to school, I was the oldest player on my team. I've been out west too, right after the war. It changes your perspective on things. He fixes his gaze on Sam. Freedom, Mr. Warner. Freedom. I have a football team of young men that yearn for the same thing, for the freedom and honor that winning brings. I can't offer you riches, but I can offer you freedom. No one at Georgia cared to ask me about my name. He stares hard at Sam. You go what? 120? 125? Sam nods as Pop lights his cigar. You're too damn small to play football. Sam is crestfallen. You're like that horse. You're too damn small, but you go out and play anyway. And why is that? That horse doesn't think he's small. Pop takes a long drag on the cigar and leans close to Sam. Damn right. And like that horse, I'm willing to bet you're faster than all the rest in the field. Exterior, Carlisle School, quad marching grounds, afternoon. The dozen or so Indian students on the football team stand near the gazebo staring awkwardly at Pratt and Pop Warner. This is the team? These are the mighty Indians that have been in all the papers? Pratt ignores the skepticism and sarcasm. Indeed they are. The papers were right. You Indians aren't as big in real life as those dime pulps. What they lack in size, they more than make up in spirit. It's their biggest asset. Well, I'll leave you to get started. Good day, Coach. Pratt marches off toward his office. Spirit, eh? Pop eyes the group of boys. He points to Frank Hudson, the biggest of the bunch. What's your name? Frank. Frank Hudson. What'd you weigh, son? 145 pounds. 145. What about you? He points to Possum Powell. He doesn't speak English well. Uh, he's Possum Powell. He's about 140. No English? What about you? He points to another player, George Tibets. He doesn't speak English either. Why not? He's only been here two weeks. Pop stares at Sam. 
What's his name? I don't know. He's Ho Chunk. I don't speak Ho Chunk. How many of you speak English? Sam, Frank, and Stacy, and about half the kids raise their hands. The rest stare back blankly. Sam tosses Pop his football. You teach us how to win. Well, Chief, that was the plan until five minutes ago. I can't teach if you don't understand me. He looks around, spotting a can of whitewash next to the gazebo. He jogs over and grabs the can and a brush, snatches players, and starts slapping paint on their shirts. The Indians are unsure of what to do, but their curiosity gets the better of them, and they play along. You three, translate to your native tongues. Sam, Stacy, and Frank do as they're told. It's been said that football is a brutish sport exploiting man's baser instincts, but I contend it is a game of cunning, intellect, and artifice. It is a game of chess played the Yankee way. No kings and all pawns. Brute strength doesn't win football games, boys. Knowledge does. Grinning, he looks up at the boys. He knows they may not all understand him now, but he's got their attention. And English has never been a prerequisite for knowledge. I know plenty of dummies that spout out in English and don't have a bean of common sense rattling around in between their ears. He laughs. Pop drops the paint can and starts lining the boys up against each other. All right, then. Lesson one. The fundamentals of football. Offense and defense. He's painted X's and O's on each of the players, creating the first interactive diagrammed playbook. Long dissolved to exterior Carlisle train station morning. The train station is a blur of motion with the arrival of the Union Pacific train from Chicago. Porters load and unload luggage as passengers hurry about the platform. Super, three years later. Jim Thorpe, a shy teenage boy in tattered overalls and long hair, emerges from the last passenger car. In one hand, he clutches a worn leather satchel, decorated with beads containing all his earthly belongings.